episode number five of the Paranormal Planes. I want to start off by saying, wow, thank you for everyone that has came and liked the page. And if you know anybody that is into the paranormal or that you know has ghost stories, Bigfoot stories, UFO stories, anything paranormal, direct them to the page there, uh, have them like it and well, share it with all your friends. I want to keep doing this as long as we can, as long as we keep getting the stories in, as long as we have interest in it. I absolutely love the paranormal and I love all the aspects of it, whether it be the ghosts, the Bigfoot, the UFOs, the cryptids. I think that the Chupacabra is absolutely adorable, which most people, I don't know, get freaked out by it or whatever, but I don't know, I, I really like it. So, another thank you I would like to say is thank you hugely to my son that has got me set up with a desktop now. I was running everything on a laptop and it just was not working for me right for um, the multiple displays that I wanted to use and the room I had to work with and then, I don't know, we just had all kinds of issues with the laptop, it seemed, and with this desktop, now that we got it set up, he helped me get everything set up correctly, that it's absolutely amazing. Uh, got it just sitting on the floor, and I got nothing but my monitor sitting up on the desk here. It's totally awesome. Well, let's see, we've been keeping up with the 970 Paranormal Group there in Loveland, Colorado. Uh, they have done another investigation. There should be new information up there on their Facebook page for you. Uh, they said this place is even more haunted than the uh, Firefighters Museum. So they were reviewing evidence, Brian had told me. So they will be getting out uh, new stuff on their Facebook page, 970 Paranormal, and as well as well the YouTube and their Facebook I'm sure they'll put information on both those because they kinda you know seem to keep those updated really well and we're gonna have another interview with their entire group here sometime uh, soon those guys are excited to get back in and do some more uh, uh, talking with me and showing me the different places that they go to and keeping us updated we plan on going on a trip to Colorado here, hopefully in May, and uh, they have invited us to an investigation in the newest place that they have picked up there, and they said that has got a lot of activity. I know there's like tunnels and everything in there. I know I'm one of those that kind of creeped out about the small spaces, but I don't know, maybe in the dark you don't know if you're in a small space or not. Who knows? We'll check it out. But, Definitely excited to get there with the 970 Paranormal team there in Loveland and go check out some some different venues with them. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and definitely excited to get an interview down with those guys. I absolutely love the last interview. Uh, it, it makes a lot less work for me. I, I just sit there and uh, ask a couple questions and then listen to the amazing stories that they tell. So. Well, um, like I said, thank you everyone. We are growing amazingly. And it just it fills my heart to look at the Facebook every day. And this many people have liked it, that many people have liked it, and we're over 100 likes. So that's, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart once again. It means there's at least 100 people out there that are interested in the paranormal in our beautiful Great Plains here. And like I said, you know, uh, you can get to us your stories through the Facebook page, Paranormal Planes Podcast on Facebook. You can go there and send me a message with your story in it, or you can post it directly to the page there. You know, make your little post there, and either way, I will get it up on the next episode that we do. I would like to thank everybody that has contributed so far with the stories, and I'm going to probably do some open lines here again soon. Those are always an awesome thing. The, um, hopefully have some more guest hosts in here 
trying to get my friend Trish in. It's, it's really hard because we both have kids and, you know, get her in here to do some co-hosting with me. Uh, I think it'll be a great time. It'll be more people to talk and we just have a great time when we're together laughing and, you know, having a great time. But we're very serious as well together about the paranormal. So I think it'll be a good thing if we can get her in here to host with us. And she knows a lot of people with paranormal stories too. So that'll be an excellent thing to bring even more people to the page. Well, the first story for tonight is from Iowa and it comes from Herman. This incident happened about one month ago. It had been a long day and I was about to fix supper for my wife and I. She was in the bedroom folding clothes and I walked into the kitchen. We live in an open environment apartment. This means the counter with a sink runs between the kitchen and living area. Since it is only a counter, I can see all the way to the front of the apartment and out of the outside. I was standing there thinking about what to fix and I noticed something white behind me. I turned and I could see the cabinets and refrigerator. Now the cabinets are a dark wood and the fridge is black so there is nothing white there. I turned back to the sink and again I saw the white behind me through the front window. Outside it is night and dark and there is no lights so the white I saw was definitely inside. I focused my eyes even closer and began to see two distinct figures of white. I thought at first that they were wearing white robes, but more I looked, the more I realized that they themselves were white color. They were coming back and forth like curtains in the wind. But the windows were closed, and we also have no curtains on them, just open blinds. I noticed one of them was a little shorter than the other, and I saw the shorter one was holding an orange orb about the size of a basketball. The orb was glowing, and when I looked behind me, there was nothing there. Again, I turned back to the sink and looked to see the shorter one dropping down like it was kneeling. Then it rose again. I swayed back and forth, and it seemed to follow my movements. I raised my arms to see if they would, but my wife came into the room and asked what I was doing. I looked, and they were gone. I felt strong, cold air when they were there, and then the room warmed up when we were, they were gone. I just told my wife I was stretching. I kept looking for them to reappear, but I have not seen them since. I would like to know who or what they were, and what was the orange orb. I don't know, was this a ghost story, or was it an alien story? Hmm. You'll have to decide that for yourself. All right, the next story, Angela's going to read us, and it comes from Elena in Kansas. It happened a few months back or so. I can't remember exactly. I went to bed later than usual that night. I fell asleep just fine. I had my fan going, and my lamp was on. I forgot to turn it off that night. No, my fan was placed at the end of my bed, and it was on as high as it could go. I was sleeping when I noticed that my surroundings became aware to me. I did not open my eyes. I was too afraid to, and I just knew I would see something that would frighten me. Not long after, my body becomes warm and tingly. At this point, I was not afraid. The longer I laid there wondering what was going on, I felt the movement of my body stop. The warm, not-so-scary feeling was gone, and I could no longer move. Right away, it seemed dark, and my fan tumbled out nothing but silence. I am shaking and sweating, still have not opened my eyes. I had this weird feeling, and right then I felt a face hover right above mine. I was still complete- it was still complete silence in my room. The air felt thick. It was almost like I heard the lips break apart before speaking. That is when I hear a deep, angry, and old man's voice. I hate you. I will hurt you. I wanted to scream but my mouth does not budge. I wanted to get up and run, but I could not move my body. All I could do at this point was think, go away, go away, leave me alone. I started praying, anything to get out of this situation. All at once, everything lifted. I no longer felt a man hovering over my head, 
My fan tunneled back in, and I could see light through my shut eyes. I waited a couple of minutes before moving or opening my eyes. Once I did, I turned on my TV, calmed down, and went to bed a couple hours later. It doesn't end there. In the morning, I told my dad. He just looked shocked, then told me how he had nightmares about a man's face floating around that exact night. He told me he, how he woke up covered in sweat. Absolutely creepy. I, I hear those stories there about people hovering over you, and I'd, yeah, I would need to change myself and the bed sheets if I woke up and there was somebody hovering over me. Ugh, I don't know. Love these stories. You get that creepy feeling, and it just get you all amped up for the night, especially when you're doing it like I do down here in the dark. So, all right, we're going to get to the next story here in a minute, but I got to go grab some bourbon. I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm back here. We're going to move on to some UFO sightings, and this one was from March 4th, so not that long ago, actually just last week, and it was in Sioux Falls. It was a stationary object, four lights in a pattern. When I first saw it, not necessarily seen a ship per se, but the lights, four lights that expanded and came back to a center point. When it expanded, they were going clockwise in a circle. They went from center and spread out to exact distance every time and rotated. Same pattern every time. It was over a house. So the size in comparison, it was bigger. I have video, two video pictures, no sound. Airport was 10 miles from location. No drone either. So this person had seen a UFO in Sioux Falls. It sounds pretty cool. And uh, oh, pretty self-explanatory there on what he saw. But uh, there has been a lot of reports of uh, UFO settings in Sioux Falls, and I, I'm out there to smoke a lot, and I have never seen anything cool in the sky. But hopefully someday I'll get to experience it. Uh, this one comes from Roscoe. Uh, it's 8 to 10 miles west of U.S. Highway 12. It says, I saw a black cylinder. I was driving home from seeing my mother. This is a two-hour drive. The time was 6.07 p.m. I know it was the same time because I was using voice dictation to talk to my brothers and sisters. I voice text them to tell them I was seeing a long black something in the sky with a long black smoking tail, like a comet. The object was traveling from west to east and from my left slowly banking to the right it went straight for a while before it made a small angle to the right, like it was bending to the right, and then up into the clouds. It was long, black, and cylindrical. There were no wings I could see, nor were there any lights. This was at dusk. Usually, if there's a jet flying with a smoke exhaust, it was lit up with the evening light. but. This was pure black. Very odd experience. Well, I don't know. It's, they've got like so many different things here than like normal UFO sightings. Uh, normally, you got the ship with the lights, uh, disc-shaped objects, but they're seeing all kinds of weird stuff in the skies here. Uh, I don't know. It kind of makes you wonder, uh, military, or if it is actually alien UFO sightings and all. Definitely stuff that's unidentified, so. Well, let's see what else we got here. Uh, I've uploaded a drawing of what I saw, the best of what I could on the back of an envelope. The only thing on me at the time. I can't get over what my eyes were seeing, nor how black this entire object and smoke were. I also have uploaded a map. I was between the towns of Lowell and Roscoe on Highway 12. I voice texted my brother and sister and asked them to go outside if they could see anything, just in case it was higher up. My brother is in Mobridge, South Dakota, my sister in Wombly, South Dakota, 
and Lander, Wyoming. I just wanted someone else to see what I was seeing, but there was no one. So obviously, his brother and sister didn't see anything there. When I got home and thought about it, I thought maybe it was a rocket? I don't know. As far up, the drawing is showing as it appeared in my front windshield as it passed over me. I had a sense of something was up there, like a peripheral view. As I looked up, I would estimate my steering wheel to the left corner or the edge of the front windshield when I first noticed it. I didn't hear any noise, so I'm assuming it was pretty high up, which made me think of a jet. But as I watched it and the road was driving, er, as I watched it and the road as I was driving, I thought it was odd. No wings, no lights. South Dakota is wide open spaces and we see lots of jets overhead. You can make out wings and blinking lights. This had none. Also, in western South Dakota, there is Ellsworth Air Force Base. Could it have been a rocket? I don't know. That's, you know, what I was thinking too. Uh, out there, western South Dakota, you got the Air Force Base. It could be all kinds of things, but who knows? Uh, okay, uh, well, it says on this map, if you look between the towns of Mobridge and Aberdeen, is Highway 12. I was traveling that highway between the towns of Bodle and Roscoe. I would estimate about 8 to 10 miles west of Roscoe on that highway. I'm traveling east about 68 miles per hour. Cruise control. At 612, I have a text message to my siblings because I stopped in Roscoe for a few minutes to send them a text message about my thoughts. They were texting me to film it, but I can't film and drive at the same time. I suppose I could have stopped but I really didn't want to. I didn't think to look at a mile marker. As for the size, I thought it was about the size of an airliner. I had to look up the sizes of airliners, bigger than a private jet, smaller than a United Airlines plane. I know there are various sizes relative to the disk size of the moon or the sun, much smaller. I hope that helps. Well, I don't know, that's a pretty good explanation, you know. Uh, I don't know, uh, you just think about that as well, you know, everybody's got their cell phones nowadays, and, you know, everybody's like, why don't you take a picture? Well, you're going to have to have an amazing camera to really see anything. Uh, <laughs> anybody that's taken pictures, uh, or tried to take pictures of, like, the moon, I mean, you're going to have to have a really expensive camera. Uh, with, I don't know, I don't even know how to explain it, but I've tried to take a picture of the moon that looks so beautiful on a phone that I have, and it's just a little white dot, so as far as pulling over and getting a picture with your cell phone, it's going to have to be one hell of a cell phone to make it a good image, or be even be able to make out anything in picture like that, you know, I don't know, not everybody brings a camera around on them, you know, everybody's always, oh, did you take a picture, did you take a picture, uh, first off, if your picture's not going to come out, you know that, because your camera's crap, why waste the time when you're, you know, trying to visually look at it and say, hey, what the hell is this, and it's another thing too, you know, you're having these experiences, uh, whether it be... Uh, Bigfoots, the UFOs, the uh, haunting activity. You don't think to yourself, oh damn, I better grab my camera. You're fixated on it. It's like, whoa, what, what's happening right now? Your brain's not saying, grab a camera. It's saying, it, it, is this really real? Am I really seeing this? Uh, what's going on? I totally understand, you know, that people just don't have any evidence or whatever. Unless you're actually doing an investigation, you know, then you're going to have all the stuff on you, but when it happens to people like this, you know, more times than not, they're not going to just whip out a camera and take a picture. They're going to be thinking to themselves, you know, what the heck's going on? <laughs> and by the time it's over, they're like, oh, I should have grabbed my camera. Well, that's not what you're thinking about at the time. I totally understand that. <laughs> okay. 
Let's go on to something different. Here is a Bigfoot story from Big John Smith, and this is from Montana. Lolly and Joff and I were fish flying, fly fishing the Missouri up in Montana at a favorite spot. I won't say exactly where, but it's several clicks downriver from the dam. The area was high brush and had those willows lining the river. Some trees, but mostly flats that climbed into the surrounding mountains covered with pines. We've seen bear in that place before, but they were far off. This spot was fairly well concealed from being seen. Once we were in the water and busy fishing, it was dawn coming up. Lolly and Joff were about 70 yards downstream from me, and I was busy casting when a rock came flying and popped into the water about a couple feet in front of me. So I yelled at those guys and told them to knock it off, but I don't think they heard me, and I think they were just busy fishing from what I could tell. It was getting lighter, sun coming up and all, and I was not having much luck, and I was thinking about changing my flies, when, dang if another rock didn't come flying out of nowhere, splashing in front of me again. I saw this rock coming in, and it wasn't in my buddy's, or from my buddy's direction either. About that minute, the thought struck me, I'd better look around to see who was screwing around with me, and I saw this dangled old Bigfoot in a squatting position on the bank, not really hidden from view. Diggity dogs, I froze. I could muster no brain power, and my knees turned to mush. I heard about these, old Bigfoot and all. Read about them in the newspapers, but never believed much of that stuff, or much was interested in Bigfoot, to be honest. So now I'm thinking, what should I do? The thing sat there on its haunches just looking at me. Hell, I didn't know what to do. It was about 150 feet from me, not moving. I just stood there in the water, shaking my waders, and stared back at the thing. He looked long and hard at me, and I didn't know if I was being sized up for his morning vittles, or if he was just watching me fish. Not that I'd caught anything, you know. I turned to see where my buddies were, and they'd gone way the hell down the river. No help at all. There I was, just me and the big fellow staring at each other. I didn't even have a sidearm with me. What a picture. I mean, you know... You can't dream something like this up. He was as scared as I was. I figured if he was going to come down after me, he would have by now. I glanced at my watch. Five minutes went by. Then a few more minutes. He still sat there, motionless, and I was getting very antsy. But what do you do? I was caught between a rock and a hard spot. Now, you won't believe what happens next. I decided to get out of the river on the opposite side of uh, the river bank from Bigfoot by moving slowly, figuring to make a run for it to my buds. Safer in numbers was the best brain, the best my brain could do to get me out of this predicament. Seemed reasonable at the time. As I began to make my move, this Bigfoot thing stands up and takes a giant step into the river. Oh, God, he's coming after me, and I'm going to die here in the river, or at least have to change my shorts, for sure. But I froze again in place. The thing stops, too. Then it reached down and pulled a big rock with one, out with one hand out of the river and heaved that sucker underhand at me. Man, here comes this rock at me with perfect aim. I leaned out of the way, raising my arms just in time to see it gather up another rock. My God, he's going to stone me to death. My head went blank. You can't imagine the thoughts I had. I don't know which way was up. Boy, howdy, I was scared. At this point, I began to realize it was trying to scare me away for some reason. Because if he wanted to nail me, it sure could have. The rocks kept coming, and I looked around, turning to walk backwards and his arm was waving in the air wildly. The closer I got to the other side of the bank, the more rocks came. I must be going the wrong direction to please this thing, 
so I changed directions and headed downriver in the middle of the river to my buddies, who were surely not going to believe this. I kept going, half time walking backwards to keep an eye on this humongous thing. I guess I was pleasing him because as long as I went downstream, great, no rock throwing. But as soon as I tried for the bank, the rocks came flying. You didn't know what a great shot these big feet are at rock throwing, you know, because he was dead on accurate, usually just barely missing me each time. And another thing, he didn't select small pebbles to throw at me. These were huge rocks that made a giant impression on me. I'm thinking, okay, okay, I'm leaving, but I didn't know which way to go. Finally, the big foot went across the river, watching me with every step into the willows along the opposite side of the river. But I could at times see his head and shoulders above the willows. I didn't know if it was just if it just wanted to get to the other side and was scared of me or if he was actually trying to move me out of the area. There may be something in those willows he was after. I wasn't going back to check. Maybe there was a family in those willows. I read somewhere they sometimes are seen in families. Uh, is that true? Or maybe it had food or a cache of fish in there. I thought of a thousand things, but it all came back to the initial message, which was he didn't want me around on that side of the river. I caught up with Lolly and Jeff, huffing and puffing, and white as a sheet, and they looked at me like I was suddenly off my rocker. My heart was pounding so hard I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I near, I'm nearly 60 years old, believe me. I have retired from fishing in Montana. I don't know if I would retire from fishing or if I'd want to go back knowing that they were there and come back with a good camera and try to experience it again. I mean, the thing didn't seem like it was hunting him at all. I mean, if it wanted to get him, it surely would have. It was only like 150 feet away or whatever he said, you know, and just crouched down, kind of like throwing little rocks at him or whatever. But it didn't seem like it was dangerous at all. I don't know. I, I am really intrigued with Bigfoot as well. I think I would just try to, well, okay, I'd probably be scared as shit and run like hell. But what I would really want to try to do is actually sit and try to get some kind of communication or something with them, you know. They've got to be smart enough that they could understand some kind of communication. They're animals, but yet they're somewhat human-like, you know. They say they live in family communities and everything, and you hear different stories where, you know, they'll uh, react differently towards grown people or kids and everything. It's like they, they know the difference between, you know, like a, a little kid's not going to do you any harm, you know, what a grown person might, and they might get you know, a little more furious with the grown people. I don't know, I think I would want to try to do some kind of communicating or even just checking them out, you know trying to see what their intentions were uh, if you guys listen to this podcast tell me what you think of Bigfoot and tell me what you would probably do if you saw one put, put some post on the, the page there uh, maybe I'll ask in a post as well but go onto the page and kind of tell me what you would do in a situation like that. Of course you're going to want to take pictures and stuff, but would you try like a communication or just sit there quietly and look at them, you know, try to offer them like some kind of food you have on you or something. I think it'd be cool to try to communicate with a Bigfoot. I don't know. It'd be scary as hell though. Something that's eight foot tall and big and muscular and hairy like that. I don't know. Give me your thoughts on it going to leave you with a personal uh, ghost experience of mine again. That's basically um, what I have 
is the ghostly or paranormal stuff like that. I don't have a lot of... I mean, I have seen probably two, three, maybe four stories of UFO stuff. But it's mostly a lot of the haunting stuff. I've had a lot of that stuff happen through my life. This incident was uh, when I lived in Madison, South Dakota. And the gal that I was living with at the time was at home. And I was down at the bar playing poker. And I came out from playing poker that night. And she was sitting in the car. And I was like, hey, what are you doing? You know, why didn't you come in or, you know, say hi? You know, why why did you leave the house or whatever not come talk to me? And she looked just like freaked out. So... She's like, I am not going back into that house until you get back home. I was like, okay. Well, we go back home, and she tells me that she was on the phone with one of her friends, and well, the house we had, had was like, you could go to the right, walk into the sitting area, living room, you can come through a door to go in the kitchen, and then... You know, it's like the long hallway that brings you right back to the door. So it's like going around in a circle. So she was just walking around in that circle, talking to her friend on the phone. And she gets right by the basement door. And all of a sudden, there's just this humongous pounding on the door. She said you could see the door, like, buckling out. This is a heavy, old wooden door because this house is built probably early 1900s it had all the beautiful like oak woodwork the huge pillars gorgeous staircases uh, like all the woodwork you think of when you think of a early 1900s home but this heavy door was just buckling out just pounding and she started screaming and her friend on the phone says what is that i heard that so her friend on the other end of the phone heard this, like, banging on the basement door. And that's what sent her out the door. She kept on talking to her friend and she, as she was uh, sitting outside the bar there. And I went back and checked it out. I went down to the basement and the lock was, like, you shut the basement door and then it was, like, a lock on the outside. And it was one of those, like, chain, or not a chain lock, um, it was like a hook and key lock, I would say. You know, yeah, it's not like a turn key lock or anything, it's just the old school, like, hook that you put in the eye that locked the door from that side. So, whatever was in the basement would have had to have been locked in the basement from the upstairs, or it couldn't have got out. It was still locked, uh, but unlocked it, went down there and checked it out. The door in the basement to the outside was still dead bolted. So uh, there was no keys to the door. The landlord never had keys to it, anything. So whatever was down there was locked inside there. It would not have gotten out. I could not explain it. So I'm just like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, the, the door to the outside is dead bolted shut there's no keys to it never has been it was locked from the inside if somebody would have been locked down there and let out you know I don't know they, they could have done it that way but I don't know how in the hell they get down there in the first place it was just weird but no explanation that house had the lights and the TV turn off and on all the time you could hear people walking up and down the stairs and such all kinds of weird happenings in the house, but it was odd to hear a story about something being in the basement when there's no way a person could get in the basement unless you'd locked them down there and there was nobody in the house that got locked down there. <laughs> and why would they be banging on the door like that? Why wouldn't they just say, hey, down here, let me in, you know? Well, I don't know. Strange experience didn't happen to me but it happened to the gal I was with uh, pretty crazy story lots of crazy stories about that house 
But I think I'm gonna wrap it up now and call episode number five good so I can get this thrown up and you guys have some stories there to tide you over until the next episode. This one I'm trying a new computer now, like I said, that my son got together, so we're going to see if it's any faster to put the episodes together and how the recording actually is. Uh, I'll have to test that all out. Keep on sending in your stories, guys. Uh, I don't care if they're UFOs, if they're Bigfoots, any kind of cryptids, whatever. Anything paranormal, anything from the Great Plains area. That's what we're looking for. And thank you once again for the people that are tuning in listening until next time have a great one